The sciatic nerve block is an immensely valuable technique that has many applications in clinical anesthesia. While the sciatic nerve can be blocked at a number of locations along its course, the nerve is quite easy to find and block in two specific locations, the popliteal fossa and the subgluteal region. The popliteal block is a favorite, but it's also good to know how to block the subgluteal sciatic, as the popliteal may not always be available or convenient. In this video, we'll discuss the anatomy and technique for the subgluteal sciatic nerve block. The sciatic nerve is derived from the ventral rami of L4, L5, as well as S1, 2, and 3. These combine to form a single large nerve that then leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. The nerve continues to course down the posterior thigh, supplying motor fibers to the hamstring muscles, before dividing above the popliteal fossa into its two terminal branches, the tibial and common peroneal nerves. A convenient place to block the sciatic is in the proximal posterior thigh, where it has a consistent relationship with the bony anatomy. At this level, the nerve is deep to the gluteus maximus muscle and superficial to the small quadratus femoris muscle, which is slung like a hammock between the greater trochanter of the femur and the ischial tuberosity. These two bony prominences are important surface landmarks for the subgluteal sciatic nerve block. We're going to place our ultrasound probe right between these to catch the nerve as it passes through the middle. The patient is positioned on their side, ideally with the hip flexed to make the bony anatomy more prominent. Our goal is to estimate where the nerve travels by palpating the surface landmarks. We feel for the greater trochanter and the ischial tuberosity. Between these two bony humps is a soft tissue trough. This is where the nerve lives and where we're going to place our ultrasound probe. With a curvilinear probe placed over the trough, we'll be able to see the greater trochanter, the ischial tuberosity, and the gluteus maximus and quadratus femoris muscles. In the plane between the two muscles lies the sciatic nerve, usually somewhat closer to the tuberosity side. Close to this is the inferior gluteal artery, which is a good landmark in cases where the imaging is less than ideal. Note that the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, which is not a branch of the sciatic, runs quite close here and may or may not be blocked with the same sciatic injection. We'll talk more about that later. Here's what our sonogram looks like. We see the hyperechoic bony prominences on either side and the oval or triangular sciatic nerve sandwiched between the gluteus and the hammock-like quadratus. Okay, so here we see the greater trochanter on the lateral side and the hyperechoic sciatic nerve nicely sandwiched between the two muscles. The needle is advancing from the lateral side, aiming for the fascial plane just lateral to the nerve. Sometimes the nerve is just not that obvious, and for that reason we routinely use nerve stimulation as an adjunct to both find the nerve and to make sure we don't end up too close. We enter the plane and start with a test injection. You can see the plane unzippering here and the nerve being peeled off the surrounding epimysium. You can appreciate that the sciatic nerve truly lies in an intermuscular fascial plane. These muscles are typically quite easy to separate with the hydraulic pressure of the injection. 15 to 20 mils of local anesthetic is a typical dose that delivers a good effect. Following the injection, we can confirm the nerve is nicely surrounded by local by tracking the probe cephalad and caudad. Here's an image showing the osteal, musculofascial, and dermatomal pattern of blockade from the posterior aspect. Blockade of the sciatic nerve at the subgluteal level will anesthetize nearly the entire lower limb below the knee, save for the skin and small ankle joint fibers from the saphenous nerve. We also expect to get some periosteum on the posterior femur, as well as a motor block of the hamstring muscles. Here's the anterior side. We use a subgluteal commonly for both below and above knee amputations, in combination with a femoral block for ACL repair, and frequently for orthotrauma cases where we want to stay out of the way of the surgical site near the proximal tibia. Catheters work well here too, as the muscle tends to hold them in place. Note that a block of the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh can occur, but it's not guaranteed. Here are some tips for the subgluteal sciatic nerve block. First, it's great when everything looks amazing on the screen, but that's not going to happen every time. When you're trying to decide between hyperechoic smudge A and hyperechoic smudge B, the inferior gluteal artery can be a useful landmark to ensure that you're at least aiming for the right plane. Here we see the nerve and the artery side by side, as is often the case. Second, turning patients lateral can sometimes be inconvenient or uncomfortable. In these cases, don't forget about the Raj approach. The patient remains supine and the hip is flexed. 
you often need an assistant to hold the leg in the air while the operator palpates for the same two bony landmarks and performs a block while seated. Lastly, we know the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh is inconsistently blocked with the subgluteal approach. If you do need to get it, say for an above knee amputation, it can easily be blocked at the gluteal crease. You'll see it deep to the fascia lata between the long head of the biceps and the semitendinosus muscle as it emerges from the same plane as the sciatic nerve. In contrast to other cutaneous nerves in the body that run on the sub-Q fat, it runs down the posterior thigh deep to the fascia, giving off perforating skin branches as it goes, so look for it in that plane.